fight. And uh, we'll be, I think we're going to have some, we're going to have pizza again or something. I think so. we'll have pizza at the beginning. And then we'll be gone. I'll be, I'll be home. I promise you, I'll be home at uh, 6.30. Okay, so I don't know what you'll be doing, but I'll be home at 6.30. So it won't last a long time. And I think it'll be wonderful. If you don't know where that is, you can ask any of us after yes. church and we'll let you know. Yes. Um, it's the house with all the orange cones in front of everybody else's house in the neighborhood. Uh, but anyway, that's... Uh, um, the other announcement I want to make real quick is that on April the... Does anybody know what is unique and special about April the 15th this year? April the 15th. It's tax day. It's, it's Passover. It's Passover. True, I mean, real Passover. April the 15th. It's a Friday night obviously. And so um, uh, this April the 15th, which is in a few weeks, we're going to gather at Kim and Jerry's house. I don't have all the details worked out yet, but I just wanted to make you aware that we're going to be gathering at their house on April the 15th, probably around five o'clock again. And we're going to celebrate Passover together and eat the, the different... Uh, um, elements, if you will, or ingredients uh, of that meal and talk about what they mean, their significance, how they, what they meant in the Old Testament, what they mean in the New Testament. It's just a, it'll just be an interesting time to gather uh, together and again, just talk about one of the most significant symbols in the entire Bible are the elements of Passover. And so uh, if you, if you can, I want you to put that on your calendar and uh, come and participate with us. We're not going to have child care. I can go on and tell you that. But by design, it's for grandparents and parents and children to participate together. And we'll have discussions where the children can ask questions and hear answers um, related to the celebration of Passover. I think it'll be a very... Uh, unique and fun time so if you can you come and uh, participate in that um, anything else I've forgotten Brian? I do not think so okay y'all have heard me mention numerous times that uh, I had the pleasure of and I mean I, I mean this and I believe this I had the greatest grandfather probably that's ever lived he was fabulous by the definition of a five, seven, nine-year-old boy. No one had a better grandfather. Um, I loved being with him more than anything. Uh, I have reflected many times on how my mom and dad uh, would have... Uh, seen my grandfather in a very different light. Uh, my grandfather was one of these people that believed, he genuinely believed nothing was ever going to go wrong. Let's go have fun. He called me Joey. Come on, Joey. And we would go out and we would have fun. And I cannot tell you how many times my dad would drive me from Memphis up to out right outside Dyersburg in a little town called Finley, and he would <laughs> roar into town late for something that he had to go do and uh, make a sales call, and he would drop me off, and my granddaddy would walk outside in the front yard. We wouldn't even go in the house. Dad would just drop me off. He'd walk out. My grandfather would walk out in the front yard, and Dad would say, all right, uh, Dad, here's Joey, or here's Larry. Um, you know, I'll come back and get him in a few days or whatever. Do not. And he would make a list of about, sometimes the list was four or five things, sometimes the list was 20 things. I do not want to let you, I don't want you doing A, B, and C with Larry. My grandfather would say, okay. And my dad would whirl that car around and roar out of Finley as, you know, lightning speed. And before my, Grand Finley wasn't big as a blink. But before my daddy could get out of the town limits, my grandfather was already saying, come on, Joey. And we would go and do the exact opposite of everything my grandfather just said. 
I don't want you and Joey riding in a flat bottom, 14 foot fishing boat out in the middle of the Mississippi River with no life jackets. We won't. I don't want Joey sitting in the back, riding in the back of your pickup truck going 60 miles an hour down the highway shooting signs with a 410 shotgun. Um, we won't. And I, the list goes on. The youth, as parents, think about, uh, and, and I'm not even, those are the safer things. One, uh, one time, <laughs> we, he would, uh, he thought it was hysterical, which I was, you know, there was a railroad crossing and the highway went up a little, and so if he went really fast in this old pickup truck, he could get air. He would jump this thing. And, oh, I thought that, you know, five, seven, eight, I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. And it was. Uh, except when he hit the other side, lost control, and we wound up in a, wound up in a nobody wore seat belts. I was probably in the back of the thing. You know, no telling where, what had happened to me. But anyway, I said all that to say this. Rare was the moment when I was with my grandfather that, my, that he wouldn't say to me at some point, sometimes many times a, 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 a day, the slip of a lip can sink a ship. Joey, don't forget, the slip of a lip can sink a ship. And he got that from World War II. And the, what he was saying is, don't tell your grandmother <laughs> or your mom and dad anything, basically. <laughs> don't tell them nothing. <laughs> Just let's keep everything between me and you. Life will be good. The slip of a lip will sink a ship. And uh, that was not the, re the, the reason that saying was originally uh, created, but my grandfather used it to his advantage um, the point being is that uh, words spoken wrongly can have disastrous impact on people. Words spoken wrongly can have disastrous impact on people. That's a big message in the Bible. Uh, in fact, in my study of this the last week or two, I, I had no idea how many times the Bible addresses this idea that words spoken wrongly, foolishly, unwisely, recklessly, thoughtlessly, is that a word, thoughtlessly, um, can have incredible negative impact on people. The Bible literally starts with that idea. One of the very first things the Bible, one of the very first pages of the Bible, maybe the second page of the Bible, depends on your Bible, um, but the Bible addresses this idea that there was a being who spoke dangerous words into the life of Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve believed and embraced those words and it caused... Um, uh, incredible ruin and disaster in their lives. And if you are a student of God's Word and you read it through on a regular basis, one of the things that you start noticing is how that voice pops up on a regular basis. Different faces but the same voice. A dangerous voice that is speaking dangerous words and it ultimately creates or at least has the potential of creating disastrous results in the life of the one listening. 
I think of Ms. Job. And you, please, jump in here with me. But I think of Ms. Job. Um, no one, no one in the history of humanity has ever had any more difficult a season in his life than Job. And Miss Job had an equally difficult season. But in that season of darkness and loss and pain, rather than just being quiet, Miss Job blurted out, why don't you just curse God and die? Now, I don't think Miss Job meant that. I can't prove that, but I don't think she, I have every reason to believe that Mrs. Job loved God like Mr. Job. I have every reason to believe that she wanted to trust God, but in her pain, in her loss, in her confusion, in her anger, she blurts out to a man that is dying inside and out. Life sucks so bad. God has failed you. That's what she meant. God has failed you, betrayed you, deserted you. Just curse him and die. The interesting thing for me about dangerous words is that they make a lot of sense. Often they're logical. Uh, yeah, that's a great, You yes. know, and appeal to our, <laughs> I don't know, our, often they appeal to our ego, to our logic, to our... <clears throat> Our humanity, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. But I think the message today is that just because they're logical or appeal to our humanity doesn't mean that they're godly or useful or good. There's a difference, isn't there, sometimes, between goodness, whatever that is, and logic. Well, let's jump all the way to the New Testament. I didn't think about what you're saying. That's, that's so Great, powerful. But what did people continually say about the Lord Jesus and His teaching? Nobody has ever spoken words like that. What do they mean by that? Nobody has ever spoken words that were more contrary to logic. Who, who, te who talks like that? Who teaches that? Who values that? That is contrary to to what the mind of man would believe is true and reasonable. I think of Naomi and Ruth. You know the little book of Ruth? Now Naomi comes back around at the end strong. She finishes well, and that's what matters. But she's, in again, in this bad place. Her husband's died. Her boys have died. She's, she's left her homeland and to go to try to find a better life, and what she found was a worse life. And so she's going back home, a defeated, shame-filled loser. But she has a relationship with Jehovah God. She knows God. She knows God. She knows who God is. She has a relationship with Him. She's in a covenant relationship with Him. And one of her daughter-in-law, daughters-in-law, Ruth sees that God reality in her life. And she says, Mom, I want to go back home with you. I'm going to leave my family and go back with you because I see in you something I can't find. And you know what, Now, In that moment of that season of darkness and pain and loss, no, go back home to your family. Go back home to your gods. Go back home to, your, to the life of your culture. Think about the Ramah. What if Ruth had obeyed? That was not God speaking. That was not God speaking. At that moment, Naomi, who was a godly woman, who, who you see later on, she, she redeems herself and, and comes out strong. But at that moment, she is speaking into Ruth's life words that are not from God. I think of David and his mighty men. David again is in this terrible season. I mean, he's being ch he's done nothing but try to serve Saul and serve the people of God, and he has done an incredible job of doing so, and it seems like every wonderful sacrificial thing that David had done for Saul and for the people of God, 
had been forgotten or twisted. And now he's running for his life as a fugitive. And he has this moment, this catharsis moment, if you will, where logic is, you can fix this. You can fix this. You can, you can get rid of your troubles. What that means is, you've got to kill the king. You've got to kill God's anointed leader. But if you'll do it, all your problems will go away. David knows that. And David knows, no. I'd rather suffer doing right than get some relief doing wrong. That's a statement. But that's what made David, David. But David's best friends gathered around him. And you know what they said? Oh no, David! All these, they're people that love David. They're committed to David. They're, they're, they're serving with David. Their advice to David is, kill him. Kill your problems. It's logical. Take matters into your own hand and deal with it. Get it over with and we won't have to suffer anymore. That, that, but it wasn't God's voice. It wasn't God's voice. I think of Bar, blind Bartimaeus and uh, what was it? Jairus. The, they were two people that one was blind and then one had a daughter that was dying uh, yeah, or, or maybe had already died. I can't remember right this second. But anyway, in both of those situations, they go to Jesus for help. And in both of those situations, the people around Bartimaeus and Jairus both say, don't bother the teacher anymore. Don't, don't bother. Stop. Stop begging God for help. It's too late. It's over. To, he, he's got bigger fish to fry than you. You're not that important. What if that, what if Jairus and what if Bartimaeus had listened to those voices? That, there's no reason to think those voices weren't either concerned about Jesus' busy schedule or the fact that, dude, it is too late. The girl's dead. Leave, leave it alone. Leave it alone. You're, you're just making it worse. You're dragging it out. What if they had listened to those voices? Voices weren't bad people. They just weren't God's voice. And even precious Mary, the mother of Jesus and Jesus' brothers, they're hearing all this stuff about Jesus and all the waves he's making and the, 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 the innuendos and the suspicions and the criticisms and the, the, the you know, he just, he just calls in a stink. Everybody that comes through their town, they're saying, you hear about the crazy dude is doing all this crazy stuff? And they finally go, you know, this, enough's enough. And so they go to where Jesus is, or at least to the house where Jesus is, and they send somebody in and they said, your, your, your family's here. They wouldn't take you home. This is, this is craziness. Let us take you home. You need a rest. Again, you think they, you, especially Mary, Mary wasn't mad. Mary wasn't evil. Mary wasn't trying to harm. But her words were not the words of God. Best three examples in the Bible of this. I'm using all these biblical examples. I want you to see these pictures and I want you to identify moms. You're going to be given a thousand opportunities to speak into your children's lives. Whose voice are they going to hear? Dads? You're going to have a thousand opportunities to speak into your children's lives. Like Jairus. Whose voice are your kids going to hear? And if they aren't hearing God's voice from you, who do you think they're going to hear it from? MTV? 
or uh, or the Facebook or or, or or Instagram? You think the, you're going to hear God from them? Don't I don't know anything about them, but we're I'm not all, thinking that's we're where all the quite proud of you yeah, for knowing yeah, those names. I knew the names, uh, but I don't think that's where I'm. That is not the well from which I'm going to get a bucket of God. I don't think. I don't think. And that's where they're going to drink from. Husbands, wives, are you going to be the voice of Mrs. Job? You care, you love. But are you speaking God's voice into their lives? I think of I pondered this story a thousand times in the last two weeks. I'm not even exaggerating. Rachel, Isaac's, uh, no, sorry, Rebecca. You know what? Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac married a lady named Rebecca. Isaac and Rebecca had two boys, Jacob and Esau. They grow up. It's time for the eldest son to get a blessing from the dad. Rebecca says, well, my favorite kid is Jacob, who's the second born, not the oldest born. I want him to get the blessing. And so she goes to her son, the mama, the covenant mama, goes to her son, who is a part of the holy, if you will, family, the covenant family that... The salvation of humanity is going to run through and is dependent on and this covenant woman says, hey, do what I say. Go get uh, some she uh, lambs. We're going to make some stew. We're going to cut up your, your brother's clothes and put them on you and we're going to deceive your old blind dad. Who does that? Who does, comes up with a plan to lead their child into a deception of an old blind father? Who does that? Were those words that Rebecca was speaking into Jacob, were, were they words with ill intent? Were they words, was, was Rebecca, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess my son up. I'm going to, no, no, no. She loved, clearly she loved Jacob. She was committed to Jacob's success. But what she was speaking into Jacob's life was not the voice of God. It was the, that voice that Adam and Eve heard in the garden much earlier. Speaking of parents, and children so I've been in education teaching for like almost 40 years <laughs> and you're only 32 I started when yeah. I was eight yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and so you know when a child goes through a, an educational system a school a system for all these years the chance of their having conflict with somebody a, a, a coach a teacher another kid is 100 percent that is just, a, I mean, these are all human beings in a big place, all being herded around from thing to thing. You know, there, there's going to be conflict, there's going to be hurt and problems. <clears throat> but I will say this, when a, a kid goes home, let's, let's make it with the teacher. When a kid goes home and says, Ms. Ray did this, blah, 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 and says th this version of the story, that's a real important moment. Oh, my gosh. That right there is a very important oh. moment to remember many things there's two sides to every story. Let's talk to Miss Ray. But what comes out of the person's mouth, parent's mouth, at that particular moment is super important. And guess who it's not important to? The teacher. We're going to get this worked out. That's what the teacher knows. It's important to the kid. Well, I'll tell you one thing. We're gonna, I'm going to send an email. I wish you knew how many hot, mad emails I have received. And then within a, a few hours or a day, somebody's saying they're sorry or not saying they're sorry. Who's, whose problem is it? It's not my problem. 
I'll get it worked out with you, Mama. Or with your kid. If you or just, with your kid. Yeah. If you would equip her well, that moment when you're hot mad and you say to your child or your spouse or your mother or your sibling or who else, you know what I'd do. That's a big moment to say the wrong thing. And what I've learned from you is we see these moments, especially with our kids, but with our mate at times, where this is my chance to show them my loyalty. This, now we're not thinking this. This is my chance to show them that I'll protect them and defend them and stand up for them and rescue them. Yep. But is that, is that the greatest need in that child's life at that moment? Is that the... Is that the voice of God? Because I can tell you what God's speaking. Regardless of the situation, regardless of the school, regardless of the teacher, regardless of the kid. He's speaking that which is addressing the greatest needs in the life of that child. I don't know what those might be, but that's what God's speaking. He, he knows the heart of that child. He knows the life of that child. He knows what that child needs to hear the most. And he has given you or me the privilege of speaking into that child's life that which addresses their greatest needs if we are willing to do that. Rather than, who do, who do I want to shine in this problem the most? Tragically, I would suggest for many of us, who we want to shine the most is dad or mom. Not the others in the equation. Think of the ten spies in Numbers 14. Twelve spies go into the promised land. They come back. Man, this land that God's promised us is great. It's great. But ten of them said, we cannot take it. Were they, were they, did they hate the people of God? Were they against the people of God? Or did they wake up in the morning and go, we want to lead the people of God down the wrong trail? No. They loved the people of God. They thought they were speaking that which would protect them from harm. Don't go in there where those giants are. You'll be hurt. But it was not the voice of God. We could spend all day talking about Peter. He'd heard Jesus three or four different times say that he was there would be a day when he would die on the cross. Peter ignored it the first time. Maybe he misunderstood. Second time, he didn't say anything. Third time, irritated him a little bit. Came a day when he heard Jesus say it again. Guys, I'm gonna die on a, I'm gonna die as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And it flew all over Peter. Was Peter against Jesus? Was, Jesus? was Peter committed to Jesus' failure? No. But in love and devotion, Peter speaks. Not the voice of God, but the voice, that same voice in the garden. The real Messiah will never die. Don't you stop talking like that, Jesus. Stop talking about dying for the sins of the world. That's ridiculous. Stop that. And you, what did Jesus say in response to Peter? Peter, the voice that you're speaking right now is the voice of the enemy. Get behind me. Get behind me, Satan. That's not God's voice. That's not my dad's voice. That's the enemy's voice. Sometimes we speak these words that Adam and Eve heard in the garden out of a desire to protect, to help, to encourage, to bless, to prevent those we love from being disappointed or experiencing pain. Sometimes the reason we speak these words, these wrong, these dangerous words, these dangerous voices, out of bad motives. We're ignorant. We don't have all the facts. Sometimes it's because of, we speak out of fear or pain or a desire to control and other motives. 
But we speak these words if we're not careful, if we're not intentional, if we're not mindful. We speak these dangerous voices of doubt and fear and vengeance and prejudice and hopelessness and unbelief. We tell people, it's your body, John. You can use your body any way you want. It belongs to you. Is that right? Is that God's voice? Does my body belong to me? Everyone's doing it. One I hear Shirley talk to me about all the time is, and I'm not trying to create a problem for anybody, I'm just, I'm asking questions. But this thing about, uh, well, how do you say it, uh, or your kids say it, uh, uh, this, my, tr- my truth is my truth. How, how do you say that? People talking about their truth, my truth. My this, truth. This, I, I'm saying this because this is my truth. Yeah, that, this is my truth versus your truth. Is that right? It, does everybody have a different... Are there that many versions of the truth? Or is there, is there a truth? And it stands steady and solid no matter what. The one I hear Shirley tell me about all the time is this thing about how I identify. Well, I identify as a chair, so I must be a chair. I identify as a tree, so I must be a tree. What I identify as, that determines who I am. Is that right? Versus, maybe it's more important to discover how, not how you see you, but how God sees you. How does God see you? I'm not getting into, you have to work through the answers, but is it worth a study, a lifetime study in God's Word to discover how does God see me? And how God sees me, should that not be the standard by which I seek to live my life? Look at, you got to look out for number one because if you don't, nobody else will. you got to protect yourself. You didn't do anything wrong. I wouldn't forgive them if I were you. People don't change. They're just going to hurt you again. If I were you, I'd cut your losses and start over again. My favorite is the declaration, it's too late. It's too late. Too late to save your marriage. Too late to fix that relationship problem. Too late to, to begin to do what God's told you to do. Too, it's too late. That's what God says. It sounds like the voice of God, doesn't it? It's, it's, Brandon, it's too late. No. You're not the fat lady. He is. You're not the fat lady. He is. And when he sings, I'm not saying there's not a moment when it's too late. But he, because there's a day when he'll say, depart from me. There's a, there is a moment when it's too late. But you ain't the one that gets to decide when that is. It's never too late. It's never too late. It's never too late. And yet we live our lives as if that relationship, that situation, that dream, that opportunity, that wrong that needs to be made, it's it's too late. That's not the voice of God. Christians are all fakes. Spiritual community is not important. One of my all-time favorites, forgive me because I was a missionary, Mission trips are too dangerous. Oh, I wouldn't let my kid go on that mission trip. It's too dangerous. Could be. But you know, there's more than one kind of danger. There's physical danger. But there's other kinds of dangers too. And maybe that mission trip might address some of those other dangers. 
reading the Bible's too hard. Nobody really can understand it. Don't help the poor. They'll just misuse it. It doesn't change anything. It won't really help. God doesn't care. God doesn't want anyone to be sick. I heard a preacher on TV say that just this week. I won't say his name. I'd like to because I'd like to warn you. I won't. That is, that's, not, that's not God. That's not God. I, was, I did a funeral not too long ago. Buddy, you could have knocked me out of a chair. I was, I was sitting there, right there in a chair. This dude comes up to the podium to give a testimony, which if you're a pastor, it terrifies you when people start giving testimonies because uh, you never know. This guy stands up, dude right behind him, dead as a doornail in the coffin. And uh, uh, this man, he meant well. He meant well. And he was hurting and he was devastated and he was confused. But what came out of his mouth to 200 people was, God did not know this was going to happen and this was not God's plan. Now, he didn't mean... But that was not the voice of God. And 200 people heard that. We got to end. Wish we didn't have to. Wisest man that ever lived declared that life and death are in the power of the tongue. And either I'm speaking words of life slash that words that reflect the heart of God, the will of God, the wisdom of God. Or even if I have good motives, I'm speaking, I can speak words that sound eerily like the words that Adam and Eve heard in the garden. I just want to appeal to all of us, starting with me. Especially when I'm upset, especially when I'm confused, especially when I'm in a bad place, especially when somebody I love is hurting. Even if my motives are good. Um, I need to be so careful. I'll tell you what I do. You know, that's what good old southern boys do, right? We, we, I'll tell you what I do. I'd blast them to Hades. You know, sounds good. Sounds loyal. But it's just not of God. The Word of God is filled with words of encouragement and hope and joy and peace. And love. But that's only half of what the Bible says. Adam and Eve, you can eat of any tree in the garden. I planted every one of those trees, know them by name, and I designed them so for your enjoyment. Eat of all of them. That, that's, that's what we love saying, right? That's what we love saying. Words of joy and life and abundance and encouragement. But then it, but if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll die. Oh, well, that's, no, that, that's a crummy word. That's a limiting word. That's a restrictive word. I don't identify with that. that that's not my truth. That doesn't make me feel good. That's, that's true. But oh, that Adam and Eve had embraced that second half. God loves us so much that He tells us the bad news. 
not just the good news. In fact, Dr. Rogers used to say there isn't any good news without the bad news. It's the bad news, the, the badness of the bad news makes the goodness of the good news really good. And so to say, it's sort of like that. I just want to challenge us in our attempt to show support and loyalty and to protect and to encourage and to show love and to impact those we care about with good stuff to be so careful about saying things that sound more like what Adam and Eve heard in the garden than uh, what our Heavenly Father wants the people that we care about to hear from Him. Okay, anything else, friend? Uh, no, well, yes. My fa- you know, one of my favorite writers is Annie Dillard. I was just thinking Annie, this. Annie, Annie, Annie. I was just ah. thinking about this when Larry was speaking. She said one of the best disciplines she ever learned, she learned it far too late, she says, is to learn to gag the commentator. Remember that phrase? Mm. I don't have to comment on everything. Dang. Dang. I'll leave it at that. Paul, I'll end with this. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all Scripture is given under the inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, was it for, do- for doctrine, for proof, for correction, and for instruction? And those four words, you know what those four words mean? Uh, in Greek, mean? Tells us what to do and what not to do. What to believe and what not to believe. Notice, half of the reason God gave us the Bible. Not just what to do and what to believe. That's half of it. And he also gave us the Bible so that we would know what not to do and what not to believe. And when you combine both of those and speak those, it, when we speak both, that's love. That's real love. Okay? Muchas gracias. <laughs> We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, I thought about, I was just standing here. Father, why have you forsaken me? You've forsaken me. And the love of God did not rush in And make everything okay. The love of God, the wisdom of God, the truth of God did not rush in and make everything okay. There was a, God was up to something greater than just fixing the immediate problem with a band aid. Oh, that we would try to see that God is up to something in our lives and in the lives of those that we care about that could be much bigger than just the immediate problem. If you would like to come and eat and drink and just... Remember and celebrate the life of the one who experienced death so that we could experience life. Um, If you want to get into identity, Jesus identified as the Lamb of God, the sacrifice for the sins of the world. That's who he identified as because that was the identity that his Father had given him. And that's the identity that counts. So, you come, if you just want to sit there and think about, maybe God's speaking to you right now. Maybe He's giving you a lot to think about. You just want to sit there and ponder. 
Don't, don't get up and break that, mess that up. Sit there and listen to the Spirit of God. But if you want to come and eat and drink and remember and give thanks, I invite you to do that as well. Okay, you come.